This week's episode is brought to you by Communicore Weekly, the musical. Did you grow up wearing mouse ears? If so, grab the musical right now at Amazon, CD Baby, and iTunes. Welcome to Season 3! Hello, and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And if you may notice, we may sound a little different today. George's audio may sound a little off. That's because I'm in a transitional phase uh, right now, and I have to do mobile studio recording. It may be like this for a few weeks. Um, George is going to sound terrible. I'm going to sound fantastic because I'm the one recording this. So it's really George's voice you're going to have to suffer through. So sorry, George. It's time for Dizzy History. So during, during his time at the studios, Walt Disney made a lot of movies, and not only did he make a lot of movies, he made a lot of live-action movies, and he really took advantage of visiting the sets of those live-action films when the production was on location, and he really seemed to enjoy his visits, and it kind of gave him a chance to travel and get out of the office a little bit. And quite often, these trips would spark his imagination, and he would return with some more projects in mind. So while they were filming Third Man on the Mountain, Walt visited Switzerland, and he brought back two new ideas. Yeah, both were pretty great, but only one actually came to fruition. The first would become the Matterhorn, which, as you know, you know, still entertains guests today at Disneyland. The other was a concept to reinvent the mountain tourist retreat. Zermatt was where they were filming the movie. It was a ski town where uh, automobiles were banned and you entered via train. The resort had both winter and summer activities, a huge feat for most ski resorts at that time. Now, uh, Walt's trip to Switzerland reignited an interest in winter sports, and he began to wonder how to make these activities more accessible to everyone. So, his interest in winter sports led to his role as chairman of pageantry for the 1960 Winter Olympics in Squaw Valley, and he would be responsible for the opening and closing ceremonies there. And the ceremonies were a huge hit, and Walt got to experience just how to present the best entertainment experience in the winter weather conditions. And he decided after that he wanted to build a mountain village that had all the positive qualities of Zermatt, but even better. And as he did with Disneyland, he turned to Buzz Price to look for possible locations. So yeah, one of the one of the first areas to get a serious look was on the north slope of Mount San Gorgonio. Mm, I'm going to try that one. In, in Southern California. You did better with it than I did. I was going to try. So uh, the mountain topped out at over 11,000 feet. It had a gigantic north face bowl. Uh, it was near Palm Springs and Walt's vacation home at Smoke Tree Ranch. However, the mountain was also a prime hiking location for the Boy Scouts of America, uh, and it would be a struggle, so Walt decided to look elsewhere. Now, he was very close to a deal with the owners of the ski resort at the Mammoth Mountain. Uh, negotiations started with Andrew Hurley, who owned the resort, and with the McCoy family, who managed the ski slopes. And all the parties were close to signing a deal when, at the last minute, the Mammoth Mountain people pulled out due to a lack of equity in the project. And deep within the Sierra Nevada mountains of California is a sliver of land. Uh, it's surrounded on three sides by the Sequoia National Park. The area is known as Mineral King. It, it began as a, a mining area in 1873, but went bust by 1882. Well, okay, so far it's lasted longer than us. Yes, yes. Time-wise. Well, so, okay. far, so, uh, far. so far. So far. So uh, far. Over time, with the lack of activity, nature took its course and started to reclaim the valley. Mineral King was not included in the boundaries for Sequoia National Park in 1890. So, in 1908, the area was put under the jurisdiction of the United States Forest Service. Uh, the Sequoia National Park boundaries were expanded in 1926, but Mineral King was left out due to the previous development activities. So instead, it became part of the Sequoia Game Refuge. Uh, becoming part of the refuge would become an important detail later in this story. Now, the Mineral King area is about 15,000 acres, and the resort area is located in the alpine terrain at high altitude. And the Sierra Club was the first organization to recommend the area as a suitable ski resort. And the conditions were ideal, obviously. Uh, it had three huge bowls, it had five-mile runs, it had a 5,000-foot drop. Um, it, it was perfect, pretty much. 
and the area provided the state of California an opportunity to partner with the federal government to create a new winter recreational area. And when Walt heard about this, he recognized that this was the type of challenge that he was looking for. And he could apply what he learned from the parks at Disneyland with, with his experiences at Zermont and create a new type of mountain retreat. And he saw this as a way to redefine a relationship to the wilderness. Yeah, so once again, Walt, of course, asked Buzz Pro to study the opportunities presented by the Mineral King site itself. And in 1965, Economic Research Associates, or ERA, Buzz Price's firm, was uh, tasked with multiple studies to de determine the Mineral King Project's viability. So the, the project would have been a joint project between Disney and the United States Forest Service. The federal government planned on leasing the land to Walt Disney Productions. The government's expectation was development something along the lines of um, other nearby resorts. Now, Walt Disney Productions was determined to design the Middle King Resort as a family-friendly destination with ice skating, uh, tobogganing, sleighs, and uh, dog sled rides. Mm, excuse me. And by targeting families, the resort would set apart uh, itself from other ski areas in California. Now, the goal was to become a ski resort in which skiing was not necessarily the primary activity for many visitors, but just one of the many activities that they can do. Yeah, so, so then attracting overnight family visitors would be a huge priority or a high one. Uh, one study showed that Mineral King was expected to have higher spending per capita than other ski resorts because of this orientation. Wow, you know, they would have the magic band. My, my magic time. Mineral King? Exactly. You know it. MMMK. <laughs> they, they smell money. Okay, so forecasters then expected the population growth would m remain incredibly high in the Southern California region, of course, which it has. And the demand for locally accessible recreation areas uh, would also remain high. Camping and skiing were recognized as growing recreational activities. And since California had a lot of forests that held snow, this was considered a good thing for the state. Now, Mineral King was located in an area that would be very attractive to residents of Southern California. And although there are ski resorts in the San Bernito Mountains near Los Angeles, Mineral King really would be a magnet for Southern California skiers since it had more reliable snowfall. And initial projections claimed that the Disney Resort would become as popular as Yosemite. Uh, Yosemite. And just like the theme parks, the resort would never, the, I'm sorry, the resort could be closed to visitors if it got too overcrowded. So Walt's vision for the Mineral King Resort would have created a, a really a unique development that would be unlike anything else that had come before. Ladd and Kelsey were selected as architects with Marvin Davis providing direction. Uh, the, design, the designer for the ski facilities was Willie Schaeffler, who worked on the 1960 Squaw Valley Winter Olympics. He had proposed a trail system that used 14 ski lifts. Now, although the development of Mineral King was originally meant to address winter recreational needs, uh, Walt's vision would also have a full plate of activities to attract summer visitors as well. Uh, so, in, in fact, it was kind of anticipated that 60% of visitors would come during the summer months and the resort would make more money during the summer than the winter, which was kind of unusual for a skiing destination. <laughs> yes, it is. You, you would think, yeah. You would think so. So the, the, the approach that they took was to design a summer resort that had winter uses. For example, uh, the ski lifts. They would operate in the summer and take people to trails and to fishing lakes. Activities would be uh, at all price points and would include cave exploring, also known as spelunking, and wilderness lectures by none other than Donald Duck. Uh, there'd be a lot of what? What? I, I don't understand what he's saying. What? What are you saying? Okay. Uh, there would also uh, be a showcase restaurant at the top of the lift where dances and entertainment would be held. Other, other attractions uh, would include a conference center as well as a Disneyland type attraction such as the Country Bear Jamboree, which was originally designed for the resort. Now, in a brochure, uh, Walt said, When we go into a new project, we believe in it all the way, and that's the way we feel about the Mineral King. We have every faith that our plans will provide recreational opportunities for everyone. All of us promise that, promise that our effort now and in the future will be dedicated to making Mineral King grow to meet the ever-increasing public need. Uh, I guess you might say that it won't ever be finished. That kind of sounds like Disneyland, does it? He kind of had the same vision for yeah, but, it. Yeah, but you didn't sound anything like Tom Hanks. No, I didn't. I apologize. Maybe I next time. <laughs> next time, okay. I'll, I'll go to Tom so, Hanks' school sounding like Walt Disney. <laughs> to do it that way. All right. So um, all of these different activities would be contained in a high-density, compact, pedestrian-oriented village. The, the site plan, though, was designed to minimize the impact on the surrounding valley. The three to uh, four-story buildings would be heavily themed and integrated into the environment. Guests would have felt like they have stepped into an alpine village. The, the buildings would have been arranged to form a main street with protected plazas uh, between the buildings. 
Now, the proposed resort would have two hotels, one deluxe and another moderate, plus a dormitory. Now, the original plans called for accommodations for 7,200 people, which would include all the cast member housing as well. And there would be uh, 2,400 beds within the permanent structures with an additional 4,800 beds in the temporary structures. So through, throughout the village, the architecture would resemble Swiss chalets. Uh, there would be lots of pitched roofs, uh, buildings with wide balconies, and you know all the structures would be facing the main street at the zero lot line. And this would have created a very intimate and welcoming space similar to Main Street USA at Disneyland. Now, to support all these guests, the resort would feature up to 10 restaurants that covered the entire price spectrum. And there would be a wide variety of act activities, including horseback riding, tennis, and swimming, and all that stuff. And other facilities would have included a hospital, a gas station, a chapel, a power station, and even an ice skating rink. Essentially, its own little town. Except no mention of a library. No, I'm sorry, George. Hate to break it to you. They're That's going to okay. ski, not to read. <laughs> they could read and ski, right? Uh, yeah. You, you let oh. me know how that works out for you. Yeah. Never mind. Okay. All right, so this proposal featured a unique way to access the resort as well. Automob automobile access would be limited, and most guests would take a train from a large parking structure down in the valley. The train would crawl around the side of the mountain to a central station at the heart of the Mineral King Resort. Now, access to the resort was a big concern and ultimately one of the things that made the project unravel. Uh, Walt had ERA study the viability of a train, and the methodology meant looking at attendance patterns at other national parks. And they considered a fee to enter the park by automobile as well as paying for a ticket to ride a train, but ideally, Walt preferred the train, which, uh, again, limited automobile access in, in the, the resort area. Now, the train would provide the highest revenues and have the least impact on resort facilities. And there's also some other benefits. It, it would also uh, enhance the goal of more overnight visitors. And, you know, of course, more overnight visitors mean they spend more money, which is what people <laughs> want. And something like an old-fashioned cog steam train would become an attraction in its own right. And there was even talk about installing a, a monorail system of some sort as well. Wow. So uh, much of the analysis regarding access was driven by the, the low capacity of the existing all-season highway. The, the study itself looked at keeping the highway as an alternative way to enter the resort, uh, but they, they determined that this would threaten the viability of a fixed rail system and cause um, other problems for the project. Now, the highway was annexed into the Caltrans system, the state's transportation agency, and a $30 million upgrade program was approved by the state legislature in 1965. And the next step in the process would be to widen and straighten the access road, and approvals for the project and the roadway were in place by December 1967. So as the, as the project moved along, Disney hoped to have the first phase of the resort open by 1973 and fully up to speed by 1976. And the, uh, the initial cost estimate for the project was $35 million. Uh, beyond the transportation network and the construction of the village, other infrastructure costs included the, uh, the constructions of dams on one of the mountainsides to prevent debris from washing down into the valley, as well as a 10-story underground garage capable of holding 3,600 cars. Um, the design for the project was considered so innovative that Walt and his team won an American Forestry Association Award for Outstanding Service in Conservation of American Resources in 1966. Now, the Sierra Club first identified Mineral King as a potential location for a ski resort, but at this point, they would come out strongly against this Disney project. Um, they decided to sue the federal government. Uh, the, the Sierra Club attorneys argued that the United States Forest Service did not follow its own rules with regards to lease terms. And they reminded the courts that the roadways within the national parks and forests were meant to be limited in size and not to be used as access roads from one destination to another. And since the access road had to cross through the national park property before entering the Mineral King, it technically did not fit within the rules. Well, the, the Sierra Club argued that the size and scope of the Disney proposal was, wasn't compatible with the goals of a national game refuge. So you've got to remember, back in 1926, the United States Forest Service annexed the Mineral King area into the Sequoia Game Refuge instead of the National Park. The case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court determined that the Sierra Club did not have standing before the court on this issue, but the ruling was also kept open uh, the door to amend the lawsuit. So that is what the Sierra Club did, uh, and they kind of dragged the case on. And as it continued going on, additional environmental studies were required, and the project was scaled back by half. 
And as the as the two sides prepared to go to court, Disney claimed that it wouldn't pay for the roadway improvements, and the state decided that they wouldn't pay for it either. So uh, after all this effort, it was determined that the economics for Disney did not pencil out, and Mineral King was annexed into the National Park in 1978. Now, uh, Buzz Price would kind of disagree with a lot of people's assessment on the project. Uh, Price, uh, he went on to say, like everyone who had worked on the stunning project, uh, we believed the Mineral King would have been the greatest winter resort in the world, bar none. And some of the key concepts from the Mineral King project would resurface many years later in an update to the National Park Service draft's uh, Yosemite Valley Master Plan when it was released in the year 2000. But unfortunately, we never got the fully realized project. But we did get the Country Badge Jamboree. So we, we have that going for us. So and the scary thing nice. is this could be Mineral King Weekly. That, well, we never considered that before. Yeah, we could. You Let's know, never if consider that huge again. Success. A huge success? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, no, if it had been a huge success. Oh, if it had Mineral been a huge success. I gotcha. It could be Mineral King Weekly. No, I don't like the sound of that. No, yeah, it doesn't no. work as well. Thanks anyway, though. He's a nerd. He's a, nerd. He's a geek. He's a geek. But we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his beat. Ha! It's George's Book of the Week. This week, the book is Every Guest is a Hero by Adam Berger, uh, released in 2013, and it has 260 pages. Adam is the president of Berger Creative Associates. He's worked on Dollywood, Kennedy Space Center, Nickelodeon, Paramount Parks, SeaWorld Six Flags, Universal Studios Florida, and Walt Disney Imagineering, uh, plus a lot more that I just, we ran out of time. Okay, so the full title of the book is Every Guest is a Hero, Disney's Theme Parks and the Magic of Mythic Storytelling. And the title alone should be enough to tell you what the book's about. Adam takes the concepts of the mythical hero and the hero's journey uh, from Joseph Campbell and applies the concepts to Disney attractions. And I, I want to start off by saying that I'm really glad that a book like this was written and published, especially after experiencing the looks of uh, consternation from friends when they find out that I actually write about Disney. Yeah, who does uh, that? Yeah, who does that? So, But it's sort of like an evolution, a, a step up in, in Disney studies, you know, so to speak. We've gone beyond just writing about family vacations and how to tour the parks. And, you know, much like Fox Fur at Passport to Dreams, which is one of the best sites out there, and Aaron Wallace's Thinking Fans Guide to the Magic Kingdom, we've got a book that goes beyond a simple description of an attraction and, and takes a look at how the, uh, the Imagineers created a hero's journey that every park guest, you know, takes. Basically, I'm glad to see that people are being taken serious as they write about Disney and that there is some legitimacy being discussed. Because, frankly, Jeff and I need all the legitimacy we can get. Because we have zero. We have zero. Okay, that's right. So the, the first section of Every Guest is a Hero sets up and explains myths and mythology. You know, the study of myths and how they can apply to theme park or theme park attractions. It, it can be a little heady, but Adam does a solid job of distilling the hero mythos for the layperson. Uh, as an example, uh, the entire film Star Wars A New Hope followed the hero's journey fairly closely. Uh, Adam takes the myth a step further as he applies the theories to attractions that we know and love. Okay, and that's, that's actually the second part of the book, uh, in which Adam looks at 10 attractions and shares how the hero myth fits and how we fit into that journey as a hero or even as an observer or an assistant to the hero. Uh, there are a few different attractions he discusses, like Pirates of the Caribbean, Expedition Everest, Splash Mountain, Toy Story Midway Mania, which surprised me, and, and the Haunted Mansion, of course. So this isn't the first book to take an academic look at individual attractions, but Adam takes us on a journey that not many authors have. Uh, it will give you a much broader perspective of the attractions and, and change how you view them. It's not a book that you'll take to the parks with you, but it's one that you'll enjoy at home before your next visit. Uh, some of the concepts might take a while to internalize, and I found myself reading the book in smaller chunks, but I still really, really enjoyed it. And you know, fans that want a deeper look at the attractions will love this, as well as people that are interested in designing attractions. <coughs> Colby. <coughs> so anyway, Make sure if you have an interest in learning a little bit more about what goes on behind the scenes of these attractions story-wise, make sure to pick it up. I think you'll really enjoy it. It's Every Guest is a Hero by Adam Berger. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. 
At Disney California Adventure, there's a shop on Buena Vista Street called Elias & Company. Now, of course, you know the name itself is a tribute to Walt's father, Elias Disney. However, inside the shop, there is also a tribute to his mother as well. Now, along the wall to the right-hand side as you enter, you'll see a sign advertising Flora's Beauty par Parlor, uh, offering the latest styles and fashions. And while the woman pictured is not Walt's mother, the name Flora is actually a reference to her. So it's nice to see the family stay in business together, even in this fictional uh, Buena Vista Street. Yeah, and it's a great sign. It really is hard to tell at first glance if it's her or not, if it was yeah, Flora Yeah, when I not, found it the other night, I, I remember I, I sent you a picture. Yeah. I realized it was probably midnight 30 for you when I sent it, but <laughs> I wanted to make sure you saw it. And I wasn't entirely sure, but uh, did my research. It was not her, um, but it was. it's still a nice little reference. Yeah, so I like it, and it, it works well and, and, and brings the Disney family into the parks more, which is which is great. Always good. Absolutely. Always, always good. So, well, you know, guys, thank you so much. We've made it to the end of another one. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Yes, we really appreciate it. And again, please bear with us in the next couple of weeks. I have a very big transitional period. So if it sounds a little different or episodes are a little late, we'll be back on schedule again soon, I promise. But I'm, I'm always on time. You're... Okay, you keep telling yourself that, George. <laughs> this is why I, I'm going to sound really good through all these ones, and you are not. <laughs> anyway, leave us a comment, and be sure to rate us on the iTunes. Exactly. Uh, we love those ratings. It helps other people find us. And you can always email us at communicorweekly at gmail.com. Don't forget to send us your own five-legged goats if you run into any. Yes, because we have – someone did post one this week. They, they That's true. Or they tweeted it at us. Well, I should mention that during the Twitter section. Regardless, you should <laughs> like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicorweekly. Yep. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Imaginerding, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And of course, you can call us on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. Yep, and don't forget to pick up your own copy of Communicore Weekly, the musical. Trust me, it is awesome, and you will be singing these songs forever. You will be. And thank us. You will thank us so much. But anyways, for Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Ham Heimbuck. I said my own last name wrong. Man. It's I'm it's the worst, you're still guys. spending too much time thinking about Kristen Bell. That's probably what it is. I apologize. You think See, after so many episodes, I'd get this well, right by now. And everybody was hoping we would go an episode without mentioning her now. No, it's never going to happen now. I'm it's still, never going to happen. Okay, we're going to have hidden bells in all of our episodes. Hidden, hidden Kristen Bells. Okay, anyway. so for, for, for Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck, question mark. <laughs> Thanks yes. so much for listening, guys. We'll see you next time on CommuniCore Weekly, the greatest online show.